So first off, I put this, this slide up again, so if, you, if, I haven't, if I haven't made you mad enough yet, you can write down my contact information again and, and you, can, you can chase me if you need to. But I, it's a really, really intriguing how the panel, and this was, I have no idea what the panel is going to say, but here's, here's my first slide to lead in, which I think is just, just the way that this fits together. So this is a researcher out of North Carolina State University, and he says exactly what the panel said. Fall and early winters, because it grows a little bit in early winter in North Carolina, it grows a little bit in Germany as well in that time of year. It doesn't grow in Michigan and Ontario, but fall is all about tillering. But the key to yield lies in kernels per spike. And so still we're coming back to that uniformity, those big heads, and, and that, that whole concept of, of fertility in the head, right? And so just, just interesting how that all comes together. So, where do we go? Just a few quick things. You've seen a lot of this stuff before, but uh, you know, uh, Dennis did talk to me at lunch about the fact that the BASF brought a couple of UK uh, consultants over here, and Dennis said we're not getting response out of Palisade. And what was their what was their response to you, Dennis? Not enough nitrogen, right? And so you want to support big yields. It really does all come down to nitrogen. And that's the one, I didn't talk about nitrogen this morning, but you want more yield, you've got to put on more nitrogen. Full stop, period, I don't care what anybody says, <coughs> that's what drives wheat yield. And we are actually pretty fortunate in this part of the wheat world because we don't need to put on nearly as much nitrogen per bushel as they do in places like Kansas or out in uh, the Dakotas, up in the Manitoba, Saskatchewan, they're at 2.5 pounds of nitrogen per bushel, somewhere between 2.2 and 2.5 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. Yeesh, like yeesh. Anyway, we don't have to do that. So, so the other thing though that really, and, and I, you've seen this data, right? But this is kind of that nitrogen by fungicide synergy, and I just thought I'd throw it up so that if you weren't aware of that, it, it really, and it fits with the whole story, so if you look at, at nitrogen yield increase only, it's very unexciting. 90 to 150, it's not economical. If you look at fungicides only, yeah, we get 10% in yield, 8, 8 to 10, but it's not very exciting. But when you put the two together, right, and that's exactly what they're doing in Germany or in England, is they're putting on more nitrogen, but then you've got to use the fungicides to keep the plant healthy enough that it can utilize the nitrogen. That's really what it's all about. The fungicide is only to keep the plant healthy, because if the plant's not healthy, you can put nitrogen out on at the beginning, and it'll never increase yield, because it's got no leaf tissue there to, to be able to utilize that nitrogen. So it's a really, a really key synergy that you just can't walk away from. So that, by the way, is an 18 bushel yield increase. Uh, when we looked at it on our best genetics, so that uh, back in 2009, that was R47. We have better genetics than that now. But that was a 35 bushel yield increase when we did that, that research. So, so pretty impressive stuff in terms of, of making sure that you have enough nitrogen there and that, they, that you use the fungicides to make that work. We also did this in, in field strip trials. Uh, and you should, by the way, how many people here got RTK? RTK? Yeah? Got a yield monitor? You are a researcher. Full stop. No, I'm serious. You laugh, David. It's not. You are a researcher. If you have RTK and you have a yield monitor, you're now a researcher. And you should be doing this, doing these things on your own farm. So, Mike, you said three applications, or one of you said, or maybe it was you, Jeff, said three applications of boron. And I'm going, oh, really? Come on. But, but do it. Do the strips in the field, right? And do one application, do two applications, do three, and do none, of course, and, and see where it shakes out. Because you can, we, we do not. Grow, farmers always tell me they don't have time for research. That's malarkey. Once you have RTK, you can build the, these prescription, put it in, it does it automatically as you go up and down the field. The combine takes the yields, you spend all winter in the office figuring out what to do next year but you generate the data with zero time invested, and, and we are not doing enough of that. Anyway, uh, oops, that? there we go. So we did it on field, as, in, in field strips as well. Uh, 21 bushels the first year, 21 bushels the second year, 18 bushels the third year. Like this, we just, we still have to keep pushing those nitrogen rates higher and, and figuring this out. And if you do that, this is what happens, right? <laughs> So what's really intriguing to me in terms of that 
is, is that we really we change the slope of the line, right? So without fungicides is the orange line, with fungicides is the yellow line. You change the slope of the curve. That's, that's bizarre that we can do that. And if you look at that, Dennis, I'm a lousy researcher. Look at that, at that line. Why am I a lousy researcher? Yep, yep. Why am I a lousy researcher? Huh? Right. I stopped at 150 pounds and the line's still going up for crying out loud. I should have had a 180 and a 210 and a, I don't know, did you say 240? Absolutely, baby. 240 pounds of nitrogen on wheat, brother. World by the tail. Anyway, <laughs> we have done some of 180. We actually didn't see yield response. But so, so we end up about here. That's the way I do research. Absolutely. <laughs> so what about fungicide timing? So here's where I'm going to start pushing you a little bit to, to think about what you've been doing. So first off, I always have to remember that when I talk about this nitrogen by fungicide synergy, some people think I'm saying put the fungicide in the tank with the 28% nitrogen. Don't do it. It's all bad. Right? So the nitrogen application is separate from the fungicide application. Please don't think that it's together. But how many people here put on a fungicide with their herbicide in the spring? How many people are doing that? Why? It's a waste of money. It's an absolute waste of money. Like it just makes no sense whatsoever. Fungicide or weed control timing. We pick up a bushel and a half per acre. If we took those dollars and shifted them later, so we put them back, back out here, all of a sudden we can pick up, if I, if I took those dollars and shifted to a T2 plus a T3 versus a T1 plus a T3, what am I getting there? Five bushels, six bushels, instead of getting two, one and a half. Which makes more money? Yep, so you're using copper, so, so the, and it looked better. Did it yield more? I don't know. I don't know. I love it. So, yeah, and so the affinity broad spec turned it yellow. So first, I mean, right out the gate, what did I say this morning? When should you do weed control? Fall. Spray your infinity in the fall. Get them away from the spring. Stay. But that's the beauty of infinity. Like you can spray infinity on emerged wheat in the fall. You can get your wheat planted the, and, and, and you can spray it. It's registered. Well, at least it is in Ontario. I should be careful. I am in Michigan. Uh, but, but So you can spray it in the fall, and then you don't have to do that in the spring. You don't turn the crop yellow. You don't stress it. I just mid, I, this, this whole fungicide thing. And the other thing you'll notice is that as we move, so this is my fusarium fungicide, the T3 fungicide here is the fusarium fungicide. The, the further or the later I push my fungicides, the more I increase yield. Why is that? It's because I keep the plant, what, what was my focus this morning? Make the plant go as fast as it can at pollination time to set more kernels. That fungicide at pollination time or at fragment <coughs> stage is going to have a lot more positive impact on that plant photosynthetic rate at head time, at, at pollination timing. This weed control stuff is just garbage. Just get over it. I mean, I don't care if you run half rate and it only costs you two bucks per acre. Just, it, it, it's not worth it. Yes? If you're selling your straw for dairy farmers, how much straw do you have early in the going? They want clean straw. Yeah, yeah, they want clean straw. So spray it at flag leaf stage. Spray it at, at you get way cleaner straw with the fusarium fungicide than you ever do with an early fungicide. Because it's that late going where the, the diseases move in and give you dirty straw. It's, you get better straw quality. We have, we have some of that data. I didn't put it in. But you want better straw, you spray your fungicide later, not early. Yeah, yeah. Spray your weeds in the fall. Yeah, they don't matter. 
So, okay, so, so the comment here, so, so I, I don't want to get too far off track because I'm going to run out of time, but, but it, is, it is an intriguing thought process. So the comment is, I got weeds that come up in the spring. Yeah, you know what? If you would only figure this out, and you would plant the wheat early enough in the fall that it tillered, and we got this nice thick crop of wheat in the fall. It can be too thick, we gotta be careful, but you know, we plant on the 20th of September. That crop is so thick in the spring that your ragweed and your pigweed and all those spring annuals, they, they, they won't ever amount to a hill of beans. They'll be, if they're there at all, they'll be this big, and, and they don't affect the straw at all. If you have to spray weed in the spring to control ragweed and pigweed, it's simply a harvest aid. It doesn't affect yield whatsoever. It's a harvest aid, and it tells you you did a crappy job of growing your wheat last fall. It's really what it tells you. Yep. Yep, so it is in Ontario as well. Yeah, so, so the comment is one year out of ten you get soybeans off in September. So in Ontario, we grow three million acres of soybeans. We grow one million acres of wheat. And then we have, I don't know, 150,000 acres of dry edible beans. And we have some that goes after silage corn despite the fact that it shouldn't. So, so let's say we have eight, it shouldn't. It should, wheat should not go after corn, full stop, period. Get over it, I don't care. Anyway, uh, so, so let's say we have 800,000 acres of wheat after soybeans. Come on, I got 3 million acres. I have 2.2 million acres that I can grow those long season soybeans to maximize soybean yield. Where the wheat goes, you grow a short season soybean so you plant the wheat on time. And, and you, your wheat growers, you wouldn't be here, grow short season soybeans. You're going to be a wheat grower, grow short season soybeans and plant them early. Anyway, enough on that. We're going to carry on. The one thing you have to do, if I'm going to push you all here, I'm on all my fungicide, by the way, that my guy that got 154 bushel per acre, he sprayed two fusarium fungicides. He took that money and he didn't spray his fu uh, weed control fungicide, and instead he sprayed Crucero on day zero and Corumba on day eight. Right? So the wheat was just kind of mostly headed and he sprayed Crucero. And you can't spray Crucero or Corumba twice, you can only spray it once, at least in Ontario. So Crucero first. Eight days later, he sprayed Corona. Now, is that why he got 154 bushel wheat? I'm, I, I'm not, I have no idea. And I'm not pushing you to do that, but it's a thought process of moving those resources towards the end when you, they have more impact. Be careful, though, because I'm sure you have this disease, because we have it in Ontario, and you're just too darn close. Uh, if you're going to skip those early fungicide applications, scout. Stop the truck get out, walk in the field. We had one location that was right along Lake Huron at, uh, at Ripley, and it was a performance trial, and we got stripe rust on the 4th of, Mar of May, rather. 4th of May, and, and it was one of our trials where we, we did spray and we did not spray fungicides, and we saw it there, so we went and we sprayed an early fungicide, and so 20, I don't know if you have 25R46 from Pioneer or not, it's, it's, very good on fusarium resistance. It's terrible for stripe rust. Where we did not spray for stripe rust early, we got 26% of the yield. We lost 74% of yield. So, so, so as much as I push you later, be careful when you get when you oops, sorry when you get something that uh, that nails you. you yeah, then you got to go spray. You find a disease like that early. You can't you can't wait any longer. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's just that data. By the way, we've been really surprised. 2016 for us was a dry year. And so the purple bar is, is the fungicide, the blue bar is the no fungicide. And even in 2016, when we put that fungicide on, we got a significant yield boost. We didn't expect that. Uh, we, now, 2015 was a wet year. You can see we got more of a yield boost. But wow, 2016, we still got pretty nice yield boost from that fungicide, kind of interesting. Of course, fusarium is a big problem. They talked about uh, tiller management, the, the panel, so I'm gonna skip that because it, uh, this, this whole tiller management thing does get into a fusarium issue. And it, the big problem on fusarium often are those little tiller heads down in the canopy. And why do you have those little tiller heads? It's because you didn't manage tillers properly. 
And if we could get more tillers in the fall, the fall tillers are all bigger in terms of, of yield potential, and they're all more equal in terms of heading date. Even without my growth regulator in the fall, they're still more even. Spring tillers, they're the little short guys that get that, that just get to be all bad from, from that perspective. So, uh, and, and the plant growth regulator, by the way, it's really intriguing to me because you guys have had Palisad for how many years? And in, in Germany, they use a growth regulator called uh, Psychocell, chloride is the active, and it's now in North America as manipulator, and it's been registered in Canada as a growth regulator now, I believe, for five years, and we couldn't use it because you guys don't have an MRL for, for Psychocell, chloride in your wheat. And if we'd used that, and you found it, you were not going to accept our wheat. And so all the agribusinesses said, we ain't going to do that. But May the 10th, you're getting an MRL, and so we can use this now. And look out, baby, we're going to smoke your pot. Anyway, <laughs> it's good fun. Uh, oh, sorry. So this is the other one, and, and then I'm done. So this is some, some stuff from uh, 2005, Sinclair and Jameson, some research. And this is really kind of twisting my brain. So remember, we want more kernels in the head. And so in this research, what they did was they looked at the relationship between the nitrogen in the spike, in that little head that's there, and the number of kernels that they got. And look at the, the, the relationship is just, the R squared on that, it doesn't show there, but the R squared is something like 0.94. It's, it's so close to being 100% real, it's bizarre. And so the real thought process now is, if that's real, then somehow i got to figure out how to get more nitrogen into the head right at head timing. And so the thought process, and actually it's intriguing because there's a number of places that they do this. The UK is one, but they, they dissolve urea because they don't have liquid fertilizer. They dissolve urea and they spray dissolved urea on the plant. And the guy that got the 154 bushel, he put five gallons of dissolved urea with his flag leaf fungicide. And man, you know, if that dissolved urea could get into the plant and get more nitrogen in the spike, and that actually sets more kernels, I'm pretty excited. Yep. What's five gallons? How much nitrogen? It's about two pounds per gallon. Huh? If you just so so be careful with this. I I got to be careful pushing you down to dissolve urea. That, that whole concept because uh, it's it, you you can actually really screw things up. So be careful. <laughs> so first off, dissolve urea. If you want to do a trial, it's pretty simple. You, you buy DEF for your diesel tractor, your Series 4 and Series 5 engines now all need DEF, right? What is DEF? It's dissolved urea. It's liquid nitrogen. Now, fully saturated solution is 21% nitrogen. But DEF is 14.5 is or 14 14.8, something like that, 14.7 nitrogen. So it's a little less concentrated. But still, it's, it's essentially 15% nitrogen. You all got DEF. If you're buying it cheap enough, you want to do a trial, just use DEF and go out there. Five gallons that he was using, because he dissolves his own urea, he makes it himself. And at 21%, it's about 11 gallons, or 11 pounds rather, 11 pounds of actual nitrogen. And so it's just, it's a thought process. We've tried, we would actually tried two gallons with our T3 fungicide, and that didn't work. Like, it didn't hurt us, but it didn't help us. And that was a different project, just happens that we had that data. But it's too late, I think, in terms of getting that nitrogen actually into the spike at that spike time. Anyway, it's just really cool stuff. Uh, no, we'll skip that. If you take enough small steps, eventually you're going to get there, right? It's also a great way to prevent compaction and, and to create employment. By golly, does that create employment. <laughs> And with that, uh, Dennis and, and Martin can come up and uh, we'll just take questions. <laughs> yeah.
11 pounds. Is it 11 pounds of urea or 11 pounds of N? 11 pounds of N. N. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I, I don't think that, Dennis, uh, you stand up. Martin, come on, come on. Like, don't, Martin, Martin has somehow has managed not to have to present at this meeting yet, and that's just unacceptable. The, the wheat guru from Michigan is not speaking at the wheat meeting. That can't happen, baby. Anyway, I, I really think when you look at growth regulators, we're, we are different than, than they are over there because we have a shorter growing season, and so if you take, some of our varieties stand really, really well, right? So uh, in Ontario, we have a hard wheat variety called Priestley. And I can put 180 80 pounds of nitrogen on Priestley and no fungicide whatsoever, and it doesn't go down. And so there's a few things that, that I think you have to be careful with around that. I think what, what Dennis is doing is bang on, let's up the nitrogen rate. And if we up the nitrogen rate and include the Palisade and do those trials, we'll find that out. But I don't think it's a guarantee that, that you need more nitrogen. I, I, think, I think that's just the UK guys saying, well, why is that they need more nitrogen? I don't think it's necessarily the case. Yeah, I would agree. And in, in terms of how high we should take our nitrogen rate, I don't know. Um, the, the folks at UK would like us to push that up to 200 or even a little higher than that. Um, and they, they think that we have the growing conditions, the right soil, uh, soil types and whatnot here, that we can achieve the same kind of yields that they can achieve um, in the UK, uh, but, but, and so that's why we're doing these trials. We'll find out. We're going to put up to 240 pounds of nitrogen on, with and without Palisade, uh, and we're going to see how it does this year. So, yeah. so we, we have some data, and Mark has done quite a lot of work on uh, Palisade, but only up to, what, 120 pounds of N, or maybe 150 pounds of N? Well, 150 or so, and yeah, there's something we haven't figured out yet with that. Last year, for example, after playing with it for five years, I got no response at all. There's just, there's just, um, there's just the weather, I guess, and conditions, same for barley, and that was at 150 pounds of nitrogen, and regardless of nitrogen rate, the effect wasn't quite there. But normally, uh, we would stiffen it up, and that relationship and response and payback really doesn't come from Palisade, and some of you have done um, strip trials, a few of you here, with the replicated strip trials. And uh, so it's a tool we need, but if we really haven't taken it to advantage, we really haven't seen a yield increase unless if there was significant lodging. And once in a while, we've hurt ourselves with it, so we still got some things to learn. So I guess bottom line on that, before you jump your rate to 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, let us find out the results of the of this research. Yeah. Hey, Question over here. If, if we put lots of nitrogen on our grass, They say that if you put on about a one tenth of a liter of per acre of glyphosate, that that'll keep the grass. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 yeah, yeah, you'll be great. You won't lose your kids. In <laughs> Question in the far back. If I heard correctly, you said something about using a, a growth regulator to control your primary head to allow your tillers to catch up. Or could you explain that a little bit with your timing and what you're using? Yeah. So so. It, the, the active, the, like Palisade won't do that, it's not the right active, so it's the chloramaclock chloride, but we have it as a manipulator in, in Europe, it's called Psychocell, or, and there's many generics in, in Europe as well, and what it effectively does, it, it will also be like Palisade, if you, if you spray it at growth stage 31, or 30, sorry, first node, or just at stem elongation, it will shorten the stems just like Palisade will. It'll, if you get a thicker stem, it shortens them maybe three or four inches. But if you spray it at a tillering stage, then it takes away the apical dominance for a short period. In the fall. Uh, so if it's tillering in the fall, that's true. If it's tillering in the spring, it's also true. So in the UK, they use it on spring cereals as well, but it, it's, you have to spray it when it's at that tillering stage. And so you spray it at tillering, apical dominance disappears for a short period of time. While that apical dominance is gone, 
the, the other tillers will catch up and even out, and so you'll get a much more uniform crop. It also, by the way, keeps the stomates open a little longer. It, there's a few things that that, that product does that, that can uh, have a little different impact in pallets. That both good growth regulators, but a little bit different activity. When we were in Germany, uh, related to this, uh, they mentioned that the way they time their spring application is when the right, white roots get to be about an inch long. And that's when they put that application on in the spring. So that's your, your, uh, your how you determine your timing. Yep. You can't see that your pickup going down the road. You've got to get out and walk the field. Let's go. Yes. It's, a, it's okay. Mike's running the farm now, Dave. You can stay in the pickup truck. It's all good. Yeah, yeah you can do that. We do have to be careful. I understand. I don't know if we're ready for this yet. We're going to 180 pounds or so because already you guys have a lot of tillers out there. We're almost at such a high density. Uh, just be careful uh, with your nitrogen rate because uh, we saw this especially in 2016. We planted early. We didn't back off the seeding rate. And our tillers were having tillers and our tillers and tillers were thinking about having tillers. I guess just crazy. <laughs> And so then, then now some people are, a lot of you are anxious to get it out there now and put some more nitrogen on, just set up for a, a wreck. And Palisade isn't strong, I don't care what Europe is using, nothing's going to keep that standing up. And so until we thin it out a little bit and relax, and then once May comes around, you'll live in that supply and see where it goes. Yeah, and, and so by the way, Mark, how many people actually went out last fall on, let's say, the 20th of November and counted how many tillers per plant they had in their wheat field? How many people actually did that? Yeah, wow, look at that, two hands. Right? And so what Martin says is, Dr. Right, in 2016, we had plants with up to 13 tillers per plant in the fall. And so if you seeded at 1.5 million seeds and you got 13 tillers per plant, you said we shouldn't have over five, right? Yes. We're, we're 13, and then you go out there with early nitrogen, and no wonder the stuff did this. There's just too much plant-to-plant -plant competition. It stretches for sunlight. It doesn't, it, it's all bad. So Martin's 1,000% right. If, if, you, if you don't know where you're at, don't just go dump a bunch more nitrogen on it. You're going to crucify yourself for sure. Okay, question over here, Gordon. Yeah, the lower population, uh, that's pretty much the pattern across the board. All varieties, or certain varieties are strong differently. Yeah. My answer would be that it's very similar across varieties. Are there differences in varieties in, in terms of how much they tiller? The answer is yes, but they all tiller at some level. And, and typically here, like we, we typically don't want to get to five tillers per plant because we're not planting generally that early or get the same fall weather. I'd be pretty happy if I could get a main stem and two solid tillers per plant. That's, that's sweet. That's really sweet. And any variety here will do that. Uh, differences, yes, but I think the differences are small enough. We got we got a long way to go before we're going to worry about the differences in tillering between varieties. I think that's the reality. Yeah, and and so the question is, lowering populations, certain varieties more responsive than others. Uh, in our, I actually thought with R40, because 25R40, they said, didn't tiller as much. And so we actually did a, a bunch of trials when R40 first came out, looking at lower seeding rates at earlier dates, and there was no difference whatsoever. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure there's differences, but, but we're not smart enough to know what those are. And the general trend is right. The general trend is right. Another uh, question I see back here. Yep, so if, we're, if you're aiming for 120, 140 pounds of actual N in the spring, what is your favorite regimen uh, for that application inside ordinary equipment? Sprayers and spreaders in Michigan, let's say. You talking? Everything being equal, I would guess I would go out there about mid-April or so with uh, a third to two-thirds and follow up later um, at about gross day six or seven with the balance. When you do this in trials, it's hard to show, say, how yeah, it makes any difference. In fact, a single application is still can be just as good. And maybe it won't be true once we get to 150, 180 bushels uh, an acre. But when you're doing side-by-sides, maybe 
a single app, if you're on a single application, go uh, mid-April, third week of April. If you're willing to, if you can do two applications, I wouldn't go out now. And unless it's really late planted, it really looks like it's struggling. Wait till about growth stage uh, four. So I'm going to say for here about third third week of April, and then coming back in a couple weeks and putting on the balance. So, so can I echo that? How many people have nitrogen already on their wheat? Why? Frozen. Frozen. Clover seed. Good grief. You want to have the clover discussion? Absolutely. Get the clover on. It's called a four wheeler. <laughs> Not with the, like, no, this nitrogen on, and, and Martin said it right, if you planted wheat on the 15th of November that has no tillers whatsoever, then 50 pounds of nitrogen on the frost, not frozen, if it's frozen soil, that's all bad, because then it's all going in the water course, but on the frost, 50 pounds of nitrogen, okay. If you have nitrogen on there right now on decent planted wheat, so it's a you planted it, you know, first of October, 20th of September, somewhere in a good stand of wheat, it's all bad. It, it doesn't need any, and you have no idea what the weather's going to be like. And you get a warm, wet spell on a clay soil, and you can lose 50 or 60 percent of that nitrogen in seven days. And I just don't see there's no benefit. Won't give you any more yield whatsoever. None. Zero gain. You just set yourself up for zero gain, and you set yourself up for maximum risk. How does that make sense? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big pushback against a nitrogen this time of year, 100%, unless it's super late planted wheat. Wait, and put it on that 20th of April time frame, exactly where Martin is, it's interesting, we're just about the same date, and you can either do one application or we can split. And the split, where it really benefits, I'll get you in just a second, where it really benefits is on lodging resistance. It's, it's rarely on yield. It can be on yield. We've, we've seen that, you know, one year in 10, we'll get a significant yield increase out of split nitrogen. Nine years out of 10, we won't, because we don't get any loss from the one application. But on a lodging basis, we can actually keep that wheat standing better with our split applications. Question at the back there, yep. Uh, wheat's been green all winter, but now since it's warmed up, started to grow, it's all turned purple. Yeah. So, it's wheat. <laughs> you know, the, the comment was the wheat was green all winter, now it's turned purple. It's just wheat. Get over it. You guys are never happy unless you kill the stinking crop three times. <laughs> so he killed it once. That's a good variety. You can kill it three times. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, no, no. So it's purple. It's purple because the, the leaves are, are basically done. They're dying. And if it's purple, purple is actually anthocyanin in, in leaf. And and all that tells you is that the roots aren't growing. Well, it's frozen. How can the roots grow? So if there's any photosynthesis above, you get a, a, a yeah, right. So so you get a a 50 degree day. I'm gonna keep changing these numbers in my head. 50 degree day. And the wheat leaves photosynthesize a little bit, and there's nowhere for that photosynthate to go. So it builds up in the leaves, and they go purple. It's, it's just a stress reaction, or, or it, the, the, the sugars in the leaf would actually be toxic. So in order to prevent them from being toxic, the plant converts them to anthocyanin. Anthocyanin is purple. So you see purple leaves. And that's just what it is. Other questions? Yeah, so that's a great question. What do I estimate the cost is on this, on getting 150 to 170 bushel wheat? So, <coughs> uh, I forget the exact numbers. I, I can't pull them out of my head. But what I will tell you is that we added up all the costs for the guy that got 154 bushels per acre. And we looked at, at those costs versus all the costs that it took his neighbor to get 120 bushels per acre. And the guy with the 154 bushel per acre wheat was, was about 80 cents per bushel less costly. Like his cost of production was 80 cents per bushel less than the guy getting 120 bushel wheat. So if we can make it work, and you're, you're absolutely right, we've got to make these inputs pay. And that's why Martin's backing off on Palisade. If you can't get yield increase, right, then, then we're going to back away. Why would we do that? But... If you, can, if you can really shove the, this wheat yield, most of the time, it's like Randy Dowdy or David Hula. Like they're, they, they spend money on inputs out the yin-yang. Lord help us, you look at how much they spend, it's unbelievable. 
But if you can put those input costs across 542, is it, or whatever, what was David Hula's yield? Some silly thing like that. Across 540 bushels per acre, then the cost of production per bushel gets pretty doggone low. So as long as we're getting the yield response, I think we can make it pay. But I hear, I hear, and, and good to ask the question, for sure. Did you figure exchange rates into that too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. Yep. <laughs> you forever apply the action twice instead of using fail safe? Yeah. 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 100%. So the question was, apply, split apply nitrogen or use palisade. I'll split apply the nitrogen every time. And, and part of that is, it's an environmental win. So now I can stand up at a, a Rotary Club meeting in Lansing and say, I split nitrogen <clears throat> to keep nitrogen out of your lake so that you don't have drinking water issues. Who cares, like bottom line is no big deal in terms of what they think. But keeping it out of the lake is a good thing. Split nitrogen does that. And you, if, if you talk to any of the agronomists from the UK, from New Zealand, every agronomist there will say the best, the best growth regulator, bar none, is nitrogen. It's better than manipulator. It's better than anthral. It's better than palisade. Nitrogen is your best growth regulator. Yeah, so I think it a whole, so, so that's a really great question. What about the split then? So the split to me comes down to, to what does your wheat look like in the spring? And, and what's your total nitrogen rate as well? But typically with our first nitrogen application, if we're not over tillered, if, <clears throat> if we're looking at wheat, <clears throat> sorry, pardon me, that has three or four tillers in the spring, then we're looking at probably 70 or 80 pounds of nitrogen as our first shot and then the balance is our second shot. So that's about a 50-50. If, if I'm looking at wheat that only has one tiller, two heads, then I might go to 90 pounds. Thank you, sorry. I might go to 90 pounds to begin with and come back with 60. If I'm looking at wheat that has four tillers, then I'm probably gonna pull back my early nitrogen to 50 pounds and I'm gonna put the balance. So, so again, this is, this is more the German management strategy, right? We're, we're managing for what crop we have and one answer doesn't fit every field or every situation. So, yeah, I, that's why you can't scout from your pickup truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I will say, uh, if I may, and, and we've got some represented here, some public varieties in Agrimax and um, some, some Gentas, we have some really good standards, especially in the small reds. 150 pounds, I think it's unusual to knock wheat down especially if we don't go crazy um, thick. If we're, we're getting lodging last year in our neighborhood too. That wasn't 150 pounds, that was 200 pounds. Now where'd that extra 50 pounds come from? It's overlap or something else, but sometimes we get extra nitrogen in the system. And for that reason, sometimes, you know, I, I would recommend Palisade. But the varieties we have now, and if we don't go too early with our um, nitrogen, we don't go too thick with our seed, I think we can handle those. Some of the small whites from are we've got to be a little bit more cautious. But damn, when I see some of that lodging, like this past year, there was only just a little bit, and then two years ago we had some. That wasn't 150 pounds you were looking at, although that's my then look you replied. But there's nitrogen from somewhere else that's really bringing it down. And some of that's overlap, as you know, in the headlands or their history of manure or something else playing there. But that nitrogen that we're not sure where it came from or how much carried over from that fall application, that's probably scares me more than yeah. and how much uh, we're actually applying or think about applying. So, so just while uh, Martin mentions nitrogen, and you're really interested in the question Dennis put up on how many people put fall nitrogen and what rate. Fall nitrogen in the Great Lakes region is an absolute waste. Don't bother. Doesn't help. Full, it, it's totally different if I go to Germany, it's totally different if I go to North Carolina, because the wheat grows over the winter and it can run out of nitrogen. Here, it doesn't run out. And we did five years of trials on fall nitrogen, and effectively, if you put 30 pounds of nitrogen on in the fall, you increase your wheat yield zero. And in the spring of that 30 pounds, there will be 15 left. And Martin challenged me and says, well, some years there'll be 20 left, some years there'll be 10 left, and he's right. But on average, over five years, we just threw away half of the nitrogen we put on the fall. Get over that stuff, right? Save that fall nitrogen money, put it on in the spring when it'll make you something. Yeah, well, nitrogen stabilizer. Nitrogen stabilizer. Uh, 
question about nitrogen stabilizers. Like, yeah, so like ESN or, or uh, uh, Entrench. Add to your fertilizer, liquid or dry. Yeah, Agritain. So, uh, do you guys want to handle that? You want me to take that? <laughs> like, don't be, if, if you, you want to go for <laughs> well, I always do have an opinion, but you go first and then I'll... Yeah. Alright, so uh, it, it depends on the situation, and if you can predict the weather, you can get a much better idea whether you should be using the stabilizers or not. Uh, so I haven't been able to figure out how to look at my crystal ball. Uh, you, you look at all the different weather forecasts for the next seven or ten days, and, and it can be all over the board, and there's, they're still wrong. Uh, so, you know... Rainfall is, is, is a critical thing and how dry it's going to be is a critical thing on how whether you need to stabilize it or not. Uh, Kurt Steinke's done quite a bit of work on those. Um, in fact, I was looking toward uh, Dan, one of the grad students over here. He's done some work on that as well. And overall, it's, it's really hard to make them pay and pick out differences in yields. Um, it, I think it, it's probably just so much weather dependent. So I, I, I can't... From the, the work that we've done, we can't say that you need to do this, you need to do that. There can be, in certain situations, in one year, you can get a benefit uh, just based on the weather that happens that year, but it's so variable we can't give you a good, solid recommendation to say every year you should do this. Yeah, and so I'll just, I'll just jump in to, to add a wee bit to say that on our truly heavy clay soils, so I get down at Windsor, which is Detroit area, it's, a, it's an old lake bed, flat, heavy clay soil, 50, 60 percent clay, and really prone to sitting saturated, and so denitrification becomes a fairly big ish issue. And so the research when we do that there, something like an entrench or a DCD, which is part of Agritain, I remember this now, Agritain plus, Agritain plus, I think, uh, yeah, Agritain plus. So something that stops the conversion from ammonium NH4 to nitrate NO3 it will pay in that situation because it's a nitrate that denitrifies. But it's only on the heavy clay soils that are so much more prone to sit wet and have that denitrification that, that it's frequent enough that we would suggest it. On the other soil types, I'm 100% with what, with what Dennis and, and you would say that it just doesn't pay. We got one here, there, and back there. Sure, cool. Uh, Yeah, one, um, half the time I do, so uh, the question was uh, splitting the rate of Palisade, and so yeah, good idea, it really made a difference one year, another year, not so much, but yeah, if you're out there anyway and you can combine it with other trips, I certainly would. The biggest thing with Palisade, I would suggest, is that uh, we apply it early. Certainly when it came out um, a number of years ago, the label was too late, um, a couple of the guys here can attest to this too. That if we put it on um, at gross, you know, even if that flag is even thinking about coming up, we can actually hurt ourselves. And we've gotten some lower test weights and um, and maybe not yield so much, but definitely test weight significantly and delayed maturity. So I think uh, the label is much better now. I would use it at 10 um, um, ounces per acre, so I don't think we normally need 14. I'd use 10 to 12. But apply it early. So growth stage five, you know, before the first of May, if you can. I think that's one of the keys. Earlier is definitely more impact. Splitting, it did, sometimes does, sometimes doesn't for me. Yeah, we, we had, um, in, in my trials, I have not seen it, but in the field, we can see. Um, replicated trials that it's hurt us a little bit. So go we'll, go early and uh, but splitting can be good. But neither one I would put them late. I put them on um, uh, at that tillery and maybe grow stage six at the latest. So so you mentioned splitting the application that BASF trial that we're going to be doing uh, we will put on six ounces per acre. Uh, either one application at grow stage four or feeks four or two applications, one at peaks four and peak seven, and then we're also going to do one at peak seven as well um, at different nitrogen rates. Um, and that one goes up as high as that. That's, I think that one's the one that goes up to 240. So we're, we're going to get some data on the split application of that this year.
Too bad you don't have, have yeah. the psych cell or manipulator. Okay, then you'd use one early and, and file a set late. But anyway, question at the back. If you, excuse me, if you frost seed clover and then late May or late June sometime, would that produce any nitrogen to help the crop or would it be sucked out enough moisture to hurt you? Yeah, so the question is around frost seeding clover. I'm a big believer, by the way. I think every wheat acre should have frost seeded clover put on it because it's all good for next year's corn crop. But the question was, is it going to make any nitrogen for the wheat crop? And the answer is full stop, not a chance. It's this big in that canopy. It's barely hanging on to its own existence. It's praying for a little, a little moisture and a little sunlight. It ain't doing the wheat crop any good whatsoever. Sorry about your luck. <laughs> yep. Good morning. You alluded to having to use more salt for um, certain timing for the plants where it provides that salt for better than other plants. Yeah, so the question is around sulfur and, and the timing of sulfur. Uh, is the plant going to utilize it better than, than other timings? So, so sulfur and nitrogen in the plant are quite related. And in general terms, every 10 molecules of nitrogen, you need one molecule of sulfur in that protein building synthesis. And uh, sulfur is involved in a few other things. Like I, I'm, I'm generalizing, so please, for the, for the real science minds in the group, don't take me to task over this. It, it gets too complicated otherwise. But in, in terms of, of utilization, the, the wheat crop has, has a fairly significant demand for sulfur right when it has demand for nitrogen. And so the, the big uptake of nitrogen starts with stem elongation. And so typically around here, you know, that's 1st of May, give or take. So you want to have some sulfur there by 1st of May. Do you need sulfur through grain fill? The answer is absolutely, because there's protein in the grain. You're synthesizing protein. And so some growers then say, well, do I need to split the sulfur as well? Right? So I put some sulfur on early with my first app, some sulfur on late with my second app. And my answer to that is, with nitrogen, we can lose it. It can leach or it can denitrify. With sulfur, it never desulfifies. That's a, that is even a, a word. It can leach on a really sandy soil, but mostly, if the water leaches it down, then it quits raining. Well, the plant starts bringing the water back up, right, to the plant, and the sulfur comes back up with the water, and the nitrogen does too. So, so leaching is why you can't put sulfate on in the fall, just like I don't want you to put nitri nitrogen on in the fall, don't put sulfur on in the fall, because over the winter, at least half of it will leach to the profile and you'll lose it. But in terms of split applying uh, sulfur, I don't think it's a big deal. I don't have data on it, I just, uh, you know, as I think it through, I don't think it's a big deal. Maybe, maybe, maybe some researcher somewhere should do some work on that, you know? Uh, but uh, I, I, I put it all on in the first application to get that out of the way so because uh, you're not as busy then. Or, or you can split it if you want, if, you, if that's how it works. Uh, question. In terms of splitting nitrogen applications and what the first one on, how many days would you then come back for your second one on? Yeah, so, so exactly what Martin said. You come back at second node, right? And an actual fact, it, if you could come back at flag leaf, that might be better, or early flag leaf. The problem with it is, is that our rainfall is not consistent enough. And if I put it on that late, and it's dry for the next 10 days, I'm done. Whereas if I just move that, you know, what's that, five days, seven days earlier, it just opens the window up for rainfall so that it's in the ground where the crop can pick it up. So second note, whatever feet stage that is, I'm a Zadix guy. So. Seven. Far back. I'm trying to do that math on the dissolved urea. If I want 11 pounds of true nitrogen, 5 gallons per acre, how do I get 21% nitrogen? So it's so. The water's going to weigh 8 pounds per gallon. So water weighs. Uh, 8.3. Yeah, so, so most liquid fertilizers, most liquid fertilizers uh, weigh somewhere in the range of 11 pounds per U.S. gallon. 10.8, like 28% I think is 10.8 pounds per U.S. gallon, I think that's right. Sorry, 10.67? Well, that's pretty good for a Canadian who's a metric guy. I expect darn close, come on. In darts, that would almost work. Um, so, so, you know, it's... It's, a, it's 10 pounds per gallon or a little over 10 pounds per gallon. When you dissolve the urea, the, the, the pounds per gallon goes up. And so if I, if I 
do the quick math on that, at 21%, 10 pounds per gallon, 2.1 pounds of nitrogen per gallon. And so I said 11 pounds, maybe it's only 10.5. Yeah, times five gallons, right. Two. Yeah, exactly. So I'm in the game. When I said 11 pounds, I'm in the game. I might not be exact, but it's him. Yeah. And there's Does anybody no have questions over here? We've been like, oh, there's one right there, right there, working on this side. We need to move down here. Good morning, Peter. You were talking about phosphorus. Uh, uh, what is the emphasis on how many pounds or acre or everything can on an acre? Yeah, so the question is about phosphorus and, and what's the pounds per acre. And so pounds per acre totally depends on your soil test. And, and, and we have to be really careful. Uh, you guys are gray soil tests, right? Yeah, see, I, I, I'm not a gray guy, but there's a, I'm, a, I'm an Olson test guy. So, so essentially, when, when I had my chart up there, and I had a grower asked me at lunch, she didn't quite understand that, so if I went through it too quickly, I apologize. But my, when I said 20 for phosphorus, that was an Olson soil test number. At the top of the charts, or in the columns, we had below 20 per, parts per million, Olson test on phosphorus, we would consider that as basically low or responsive to phosphorus. When I said over 20, that's sort of in the medium category. So on an Olson test, that is pretty clear. If I go over 37 parts per million, then I have dissolved phosphorus going out the tile into the lake. So if I'm over 37 for a, an Olson soil test, and I, I'm not sure what that is in a bray, it would be would be higher than that, right? Ray is two times, 2.3 times. So the, so the maintenance range for, for us, for wheat, for phosphorus is 25 to 40 uh, ppm. That's kind of our target where we want to be. Um, yeah, and, and so actually, the, we, we would have said that, 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 so your 40 is our 20, basically. Yes. Okay? So, and, and what we're finding is that that 40 isn't quite high enough. So if I use 37 and double it, now I'm at 70, give or take. So if you're over 70 for Bray, then, then you've got to be very careful how much phosphorus you use. <laughs> But I don't want you to use zero. On wheat, you still put a little bit right with, this, <coughs> right with the seed. What I want you to do is, is this whole soil test is a whole other hour-long discussion. But bottom line is this. You've got to start looking at nutrient removal. And, and this is the big challenge. So I farm, right? And I'm not the most awesome farmer in the world. But yields have gone up. They've gone up just without me doing anything better. And, and so I, let's just say, for sake of argument, I'm a 200 bushel corn grower, I'm a 50 bushel soybean grower, and I'm a 100 bushel wheat grower. If I do the math on that, over those three crops, I'm pulling off almost, not quite, but almost 200 pounds per acre of phosphorus and of potash over the three years. And so now you start thinking, how do I replace that? And how do I make that work? And what's my soil test so that I'm not polluting? And so when you say actual pounds, I've got to talk about soil tests. But to back up and, and give the simple answer, if your soil test is over a 70 on a bray, then I want to put 20 pounds of phosphorus right with the wheat seed. And I'm not going to broadcast any because it's an environmental concern. If I'm at a 40, then I want at least 50 pounds of phosphorus right with the seed. If I'm going to broadcast, I got, to, I got to broadcast twice as much, actually I got to broadcast more than twice as much, but I'm only going to broadcast twice as much because that again is an environmental concern. So that's 100 pounds of phosphorus. So 50 pounds of phosphorus is 100 pounds of math fertilizer, right? 11520. And, and then if I'm at really low test levels, so I'm at a, uh, I don't know, a 17 on a braid, then I'm going to broadcast more to try to build that up. Does, does that help answer the question? Yeah, basically. Yeah, to, 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 a, to a, a large degree, we're going by the soil test, but, but the difference is that we're, what we're finding is that what we used to consider the critical, a 40 on a bray, we actually need to be over a 40 on a bray to, to maximize yield. That wheat's demand for phosphorus is higher than what that older data said, because we're at higher yield levels. So we're, we're saying that, that 40 isn't good enough anymore. We think you need to be a 50... We, again, we don't want to go over 70, but we're pushing that limit up, to, at least to the upper end of that range. Okay? So how are we going to put that phosphorus down with that seed when we don't have the do that? Figure it out. <laughs> Lord help us. <laughs> no, this is, come on. 
Yeah, for sure. So, so first off, the, the question was, I, I don't have fertilizer capability on my drill. So buy an air cart. Like, good grief, you could buy a cheap used air cart and, or, or put an air cart up on, on, the, on the drill. Like, okay, don't roll your eyes. You want to, like, like, you want to be a real wheat farmer, you're going to put phosphorus with the seed. If you don't want to go dry, put liquid on. No, liquid works. The problem with liquid is it's too expensive. But any good wheat grower, any top wheat grower, is putting dry fertilizer right with the wheat seed. They so, have an air cart or they have a split box drill. It, it's just the way that, that it works. And, and it, it's not that hard anymore. And as you get bigger, everybody's buying air carts anyway to cover more acres. And just make sure you get a, a, an air cart with two bins and you're golden. Life is good. So I have some plots where we're, we did exactly that. And we all we did is we mixed the fertilizer, the map, with the seed, recalibrated the drill. It was a Great Plains drill, and we just run everything right through the drill. Um, the other thing we did for the trials and tests is we put heat and seed firmers with the, the little drop tube um, so we could put liquid on it. So we were testing the liquid versus the dry. Um, and we also tested broadcast. And I hate to say it, but with the 50 pounds broadcast, yield was the same as 50 pounds of the furrow. So yep. you're saying double it, but we didn't find that. Here. Okay. Yep. But that's one year of data, so yep. we'll we'll have second year of data this harvest. Okay. There's a question in the far back over there. Um, I was just wondering the difference between the conventional till and no-till. I'm not a no-till farmer until I own plant two. Is that profitability like the Europeans are working down for five? I'm going to take that mark you and set the darn thing for a little while. <laughs> He's saving it up for the end. It's going to be a big finale. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so the quick answer is that in our data set, we get no yield response whatsoever to working wheat ground. All right? So wheat responds almost zero to tillage. It, it, it's intriguing. The Germans are still beating the daylights out of their ground. The UK farmers are finally, they, they, they were exactly like that five years ago. And what they're finding is that they've got so much erosion that they're now all getting pushed to try no-till, which is a new concept in the UK. They, like, they've never done that before and they're learning you know, what the problems are with it. But in my mind, there's no reason to work ground ahead of wheat. I don't, I don't know, maybe, maybe Dennis will find out different if he does some really aggressive tillage. But, but we've never found that. I would say the only caveat I would say to that is, is make sure you have your drill set for the soil conditions. Last fall, if you planted early, it was very, very dry. And how you set the planter or the drill at that time compared to if you're in really wet conditions or you've had frequent rainfall, which happened like later in the season, the people that didn't plant until after, what, uh, October 10th or so, it started raining and just kept raining every few days. Uh, now you've got to set things differently. Uh, it, it get as uniform seat depth placement as possible. Yeah. And you've got to manage it, you've got to pay attention to it, you've got to check it. Um, your fields are not 100% uniform, so uh, check it in different spots of the field where you have different soil types and, and uh, check it up on the clay knob and whatnot and see what you're getting there and, and make adjustments as necessary. Don't just set it once and plant 700 acres. Okay, get out there and check it. Oh, come on, sweet, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Question here. Uh, getting back to nitrogen, a little bit of 10 pounds, 11 pounds of nitrogen with flag leaf. How about 3 gallons at 28 percent? That would sort of get you to that place. Yep. And the flag leaf will look like crap. Bye-bye okay. yield. So, so just on that, if you're going to dissolve your own urea, one, one caveat, it has to be low biuret urea. Biuret is a byproduct of urea manufacture. Almost all North American made urea, they take that out. Almost all offshore, they don't. So just make sure it's low biuret, because the word, I would not want anybody to go out and fry off their flag leaves. And, and realistically, this is a thought process. I'm not saying it works. And so let Dennis, let Martin do, do a little work, let us do a little research on it. But, but the, you see where the mindset is going and, and where we're looking to, to make this work. Yep, back to back. This has to do with the total wheat crop, but the guy talked about selling it to the dairy guys. Well, they typically don't want to pay for it, but what is the total nutrient value of a ton of straw plus the organic value? Yeah. Oh no, organic matter. So, so the simple answer is, 
that in a pound of uh, straw, there is less than, and it depends on the price of fertilizer, okay? But in a pound of straw, there is less than a penny a pound in nutrients, all right? Not organic matter, so you figure out what the organic matter is worth. I don't, whatever, whatever you want to put that value. But if, if all you want to do is sell straw, so you sell a pound of straw, and you get two cents for it, you take the first penny that you get, and you buy potash, mainly potash, a little bit of phosphorus, and you spread that on the field, because you took essentially that much off. It's, it's less than a penny a pound in the P and K, but, or, or in, the, in the nutrients, but it's, if, you, if you buy the P and K at a penny a pound, you'll, you'll pay that back, and then anything over that is for the organic matter and, and for the bank account. Yep? Um, does that hold true when you Yeah, so the, you mean, it's, uh, so, so if you grow a cover crop after the wheat, but you sold the wheat straw off, well, you exported the P and K off the field in the wheat straw. So the cover crop is, is, doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Now, the cover, what the cover crop, when I say that, it doesn't matter the exported nutrients. The cover crop will cycle nutrients faster, so it's a good thing to have the cover crop there. The worst thing you can do, well, it's maybe not the worst thing, but, but this is what I run into all the time. So we get, uh, I like red clover, I'm a red clover guy. If you don't have red clover, grow oats, right? Oats are cheap and they work and it, it's just simple. And then the dairy farmer next door, the store, or the beef cow guy, he calls you up and says, geez, that's a nice looking stand oats and I'm a little short of forage. You know, I'll buy that off you for 50 bucks an acre. And you say, wow, 50 bucks an acre, yee-haw, baby, sell the crop. Yeah, so you just exported $100 worth of potash and phosphorus off the field in that forage that you sold them, and you got 50 bucks for it. Have a good day. <laughs> There's a lot of P and K in, in green material. Just like in a hay crop, you think about alfalfa, how much potash comes off in alfalfa? It's the same darn thing in your cover crop. So be careful if you're going to sell your cover crop. We have time for just one question, and then we've got to wrap it up and move on. Go ahead. So, so the question is, nitrogen inhibitor, put it on both times, just the first time, just the second time. Uh, most of the time, the second time, if you're, if you're at growth stage uh, five, 7, you said, right? Second note 7? Yeah, but se 7. So, so second time, sec 7, growth stage, the wheat's this big. One thing about this whole volatilization thing is if the, if the wind drops to zero, almost always the models say there's zero loss. How much wind? If you've got a good thick wheat canopy that's knee high, how much wind is getting down in at the soil to, to take that nitrogen away? And my answer is none. And so the second time, I don't think it makes sense at all. I think, I think that the canopy saves you. You don't need to do that. Yeah, and generally, um, I, I certainly won't either, and I don't think I would the first time. Almost all circumstances, our inhibitor program is really delaying that first uh, application of nitrogen. That's how we're preserving nitrogen. And there are cases with ESN and Agritain, we can actually hold off that nitrogen a little bit too long. But understand, that's why we delay nitrogen. That's our inhibitor program. Um, and so, in that scenario, I, I would not use... Uh, protection in that way. I've already taken care of that. Great questions. How about a round of applause for these three minutes?